Let's hit it. Booty Hoot Productions presents part two of the Sylvia Crawley interview. If you haven't had a chance to listen to part one, we encourage you to do so where Sylvia shares her incredible journey of winning the national championship as a member of the North Carolina Tar Heels in 1994. Thanks for sharing space with us again today, and we truly hope that you enjoy part two of this incredible interview with Sylvia Crawley right here on the Sports Deli. Okay, so uh, for those of you that don't know, we were supposed to do this uh, probably about four or five weeks ago, and then you were in a terrible bicycle accident, and your husband was riding in front of you. And so let's pick it up there. Uh, Tell everyone exactly what happened, and uh, we're so glad that you're doing better. You look amazing. You wouldn't have even known that you landed on your head. And, uh, yeah, I saw pictures. Uh, I mean, it was, it was pretty serious. He was like riding with me and yeah. I had my fall. He turned around, looked back and saw I fell and he jumped off his bike while it was still moving. Oh my God. Hit the ground and roll. He's in the martial arts and he learned to tuck and roll and he ran back to me. I'm face down with blood <laughs> going down the street. So he rolls me over <sighs> thinking I'm dead. So you're on a bicycle and you your bike it it it, it flipped, it jackknifed. What happened was we were in a bike lane on a busy street in Atlanta, Decatur Street. Decatur, I know Decatur. Yeah, so there's yeah. cars riding by on this side fast. And so there's a pothole ahead and I have to make oh, a sh- decision. Do I swerve out in front of these cars and get hit and try to survive a car accident oh my god do i take my chances on this pothole and i had hit two potholes before in the bike lane so i was like now these I'm- are thin tires yeah these ain't though these aren't the thick mountain bike tires these are the thin old school 10 speed bike tires mm-hmm. oh lord have mercy he flips me over i'm still alive he's the way with the pothole though oh so i hit the pothole and my my handlebars go oh out of control for a minute. Oh but I'm God. like, okay, I'm just going to hold it tight and get it back under control. But I hit a curb. Oh, and shit. when I hit that curb, I wiped out. I remember thinking like, oh, shit. Oh. But it was a long, I'm tall. So it was a long way down. Oh. By the time my head hit the ground, I was unconscious. So Did I you have a helmet? No helmet. Oh, yeah, yeah. We rented these, you know, little bike. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no helmets that you can rent with a bike. Oh, you know what I mean. And we're from North Carolina, so we didn't travel to Atlanta with helmets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back, you know. So. Oh my yeah. God, your husband, man, that's love. He didn't even let the bike stop. <laughs> he jumped off that shit quick as hell. <laughs> he's all up. He and so he's. We can holding- laugh about it now, right? A little. Yeah. He's holding Ooh. me in the middle of the street. Oh. Cars going around my legs because my legs are out of the bike, out of the bike lane. And he's like, somebody call 911. So somebody called 911 for him. The ambulance show up. They put me on a stretcher. And now I'm coming in and out of consciousness. I remember getting on a stretcher. Were, were they trying to make sure they didn't move you in case there was any neck injury? They put a neck brace on me. Yeah. And then Ugh. my legs were hanging off the stretcher. So I remember hearing the lady say, wow, she's tall. <laughs> and my, my husband's like yeah she's just playing the WNBA so when they heard that Mike they called into the hospital with a special code because I was a former WNBA player unbelievable because there were four other people on stretchers in the emergency room waiting to be seen I bypassed everybody <laughs> they took me like straight and they were running they cut my clothes off of me oh my I'm like, god Wait a that's my favorite shirt they oh cut that god. off and slapped a wristband on me. I went straight to the doctor. They put me through a full body scan to make sure that I broke no bones and to make sure my neck was okay. And then they finally took the neck brace off. They gave me my liquid stitches and sent me on by my merry way. They did give me, um, they did give me some like a morphine drip. Right, of course. Because I, I could hear the doctors and everybody around me, but I couldn't open up my eyes. So I was like, I'm either in a coma or I'm on the other side. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm dead or something. <laughs> I couldn't wake up, but I could hear, oh, I, I understood everything that was going on. 
So they saw me in this state and they gave me a morphine drip and through my IV. Oh, yeah. And I heard a lady say, ma'am, this is, you're probably going to go to sleep because this is going to take all the pain away. And it did immediately. All the pain went away. I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I could just open up my eyes. Like I snapped out of that coma or whatever I was in. I snapped out of it. It was crazy. That is amazing what the parasympathetic nervous system will do to protect you. It is remarkable. It's not like you told your body, okay, um, I just had a trauma. Can you put me to sleep for a minute so I can heal for a couple hours? Like it, the body just does it. It's just, it's, that's amazing. I felt no. <laughs> I felt no. <laughs> but I hit the ground. Like, you, like think about Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. The body protects you. That's crazy. So I didn't have a concussion. What I had was vertigo. So oh, man. when I lay down and close my eyes, the whole room would spin. I think I had a touch of post-traumatic stress disorder because I kept reliving the accident mm -hmm. and I would mm -hmm. see it a little bit more each time mm -hmm. to be able to even tell you the story now. Like, a, yeah. come, like it kept coming back to me. Oh. Then they gave me medicine for the, um, for the vertigo and, and in 10 days that was gone and I, and I was fine. But I still had like the scar and it just looked ugly. And it's, you know, <laughs> the skin goes away. Did you ever have scars from the W? from the WNBA when you were playing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many scars? Dang. The good thing That's is crazy. Like skin. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better, man. That was scary. God bless. It really was, for, especially for my husband. <sighs> bless him. Oh. The Sports Deli is sponsored by Sport RX, the leader in sport prescription eyewear. Check them out online at sportrx.com. Don't forget to enter the code DELI10 at checkout for your special 10% discount. And now back to this incredible interview right here in the Sports Deli. So can you speak on how your childhood allowed you to go down that road where you didn't quit and you love to be a part of something bigger than yourself? Absolutely. Um, I have an opinion about why more girls quit than guys. I think it's due to how we're socialized as children. There was a study, I'm a communications major. So there was a study done where there's a baby, this ball head. <clears throat> they dressed the baby up in pink, told everybody it was a girl. People immediately said, oh, she's so cute. So the voice tone raises to soprano. I don't care who you are. You can be a guy and they'll be like, oh, she's so cute. <laughs> right. They pick it. And, and when the baby cries, they immediately pick her up hold her close to the chest, they rock her, they shake her, right? She's being coddled and nurtured when she cries, right? Same baby, dress him up in blue, tell everybody it's a boy. And everybody's like, hey, little man, your voice. Gets <laughs> hey, little man, punch, what's good? Little punch, hey. <laughs> the baby starts crying. Hey, 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 stop all that crying. Hey, 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 like he's not allowed to cry. He's got to learn how to be independent, play with a toy, give him his pass, you know, and I think more boys have pacifiers than girls, right? You think that's a cultural thing in the in black and brown community, or you think that's just across the board? I think across the board, because this mm -hmm. study, the, the baby was white, <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. And they showed you the people's reaction to the baby when it was a boy versus a girl, right? And so this was talking about behaviors, but behaviors are due to how we're socialized as children, starting with our families. So I am a daddy's girl, right? And so I was raised like most little boys. I look just like my dad. My dad's name is Slim. In my community, they called me Little Slim. All my dad's friends like, hey, Little Slim, you got to be Slim's daughter, right? <laughs> and so, That's so I want to sit beside my dad. My dad's watching basketball. My dad's watching boxing. My dad's watching football. We're big Pitt Pittsburgh Steelers fans. My cousin mm -hmm. was a quarterback for the Steelers, Joe Gillum. So those mm -hmm. are the things my dad is watching. If I cry, you got to go in the kitchen with your mom if you're going to cry. But if you want to sit in here with me, cut out all that crying. So mm -hmm. I learned to not cry. Mm -hmm. I learned, and so if I if we played a board game, Monopoly, there was no quitting. You don't quit. Mm -hmm. If I started, I pl I played volleyball, basketball, track. You couldn't quit. I took karate. My karate teacher kicked me in the face. She was a black belt, mm -hmm. but I wasn't gonna quit because my mom paid her money. My dad worked for Willing Pittsburgh Steel Mill. He worked. Mm -hmm. 
three to 11 shift, three o'clock to 11 at night shift, came back completely black with a jumpsuit on, like he worked in a Coke plant. So he never saw your games? Yeah, he saw my games. He would switch his shifts. Like okay. sometimes he worked mm. three to 11. Sometimes he worked midnight if he knew mm. I had a game. So he worked overnight, mm. sleep a little bit, come out to my game. But my dad was a blue collar worker. He worked very hard for my parents to have the money for me to play AAU basketball, for me to take piano lessons, karate. So wow. do you have was, siblings? I do. I have a sister and a brother. I'm the oh, youngest. Wow. You're the youngest. youngest. So they ran track, right? We go to the grocery store. They would say, the last one to the car is a rotten egg. They take out the track. My sister's 10 years older than me. My brother's eight years older than me. And they're sprinting. I'm a kid. My mom was like, why don't y'all let her win sometimes? They're like, no, you can't let her win. She's got to earn a win. So That's I great. grew up in a very competitive, competitive sibling. <laughs> who never let me win. I was determined one day I'm going to beat you. And I have parents that never let me quit. And they were blue collar workers. They worked every day. Mm. There was no, I couldn't stay home and because I was sick because they weren't going to report our work. Take this aspirin, tell the nurse, let you sleep in the nurse's office. And when you feel better, you go to class because if we don't work, you don't eat. Old school. That's the background I come from. So mm. you work hard, you don't quit and you earn your right to win. That's it. That's life. That's it for me. Yeah. Right. So I come from that space. But that's, I was that's fascinating. Yeah. I was socialized and raised like most little boys because I was mm. always with my dad. I refused to go to sleep until my dad came home. So my mom was like, wow. You change your dad's <laughs> life. He used to rip and run with his friends and go hang wow. out at night. But when you were born, he had to be home to tuck you in at night. Oh, so, that's so cool. It is. My dad is my parents are my heroes. But so that's the space I come from. I think you see that. And and Charlotte was a daddy's girl. Charlotte Mm -hmm. had all brothers. She's the only girl. So she grew up a tomboy. So you don't quit. You go outside. You work hard. She comes, you know, her parents were hard workers. Coach Hatchell, kudos to her. She did a very good job of recruiting the championship team. We all came from nuclear families, with the exception of a couple. We all came from Christian homes. We all came from somewhat blue collar families that worked really hard. And so when we got together, our chemistry was really good. Even our parents got along very, they're all friends to this day. It is something really, really special. But that's no coincidence when you have that many people on the mm-hmm. team with those things in common, like she hand picked up and we've heard the best players coming out of high school. Right. Some yeah. I was going to ask you if she got to know the families a certain way. And you know, why do you think she got such a bad rap at the end? She was older. Some people felt like it was her time to retire and mm. she, she comes from a never quit. Like her book is called fight, fight. She's going to yeah. fight to the very end. Like yeah. her best friend was Kayao. Mm-hmm. Kayle's doctor the said, ultimate fighter <laughs> her doctor said just do what makes you comfortable in the end and coaching made her comfortable and happy so she coached and when she stepped down two weeks later she passed away like it, 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 happened. it was fat you know so you don't in, in coach Apple's world you don't quit mm-hmm. you know like that's just unheard of so I knew that in the end, it wasn't going to happen well because I knew mm. she wasn't going to step down and quit ever. Yeah. It's just yeah. not even in her vocabulary, right? So it had just come to a head. You know, there were people who felt like they, she was older. The mm. players, you know, felt like they couldn't relate anymore. Some of them, some of them loved her. Some of them came there to play for her, you know, mm. and others didn't. So, so that was the situation in the end. Mm. Um, some of the things that she did to help me be a national championship are totally unacceptable today. Our society just changed. That's what happened. Yeah, right. Of course. You can, wrap your, you can wrap your head around certain things. Yeah. yeah. How you coach four years ago, Mike, you, is totally unacceptable today. You cannot Absolutely. coach these kids that way today. And so if you are an older coach and it's hard for you to change and you've had so much success, like she's the winningest coach in women's basketball right? Yeah. Why would you, in your mind, like, why would you change if this has worked for you for so many mm-hmm. years? 
And so that that's in a nutshell what happened. Yeah, there's a disconnect, right? With a lot of older coaches, right? You have this grind, no quit mentality, and then you have an instant gratification generation, you know, and, and Steph Curry and, you know, and, and yo-yo and the ball and craftiness and which is good. You know, we're going to hopefully have Crystal Bradford coming on to talk, to talk about her story about what she's been through recently. And, and I'm going to, I told her this the other day, usually I don't say one thing about the podcast until the podcast, but I told her the other day when we were talking, I've not seen a highlight video like hers in my 30 years of coaching. <laughs> Crystal Bradford, she's got more game than most of the players in the W. I could not believe what I was watching. And so, you know, we're just living in a different time now, uh, like you said, with coaches and players, and there has to be, you know, uh, a happy medium. Mm-hmm. It does. I definitely. And you coach for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So did you feel like you could relate or did you feel like you were old school also when you were coaching? I felt like I could relate. Um, I tried to be the bridge between, yeah. you know, because I played for these coaches, right? Yeah. So I tried to be the interpreter and the translator. <laughs> right. Kind of middle but even I like I'm 49 so I was getting to the point where I was I'm the age of their parents and now Mm -hmm. I'm older than most player college players parents Mm -hmm. so you know you kind of got to stay relevant and the fact that I don't have any children had Mm -hmm. I had children Mm -hmm. then I can keep up with their language and their you know yeah yeah so I try to listen to music and I watch videos as much as I could just to stay on top of those things Um, I have nieces and nephews so um, but when you're 64, you're so far removed from that. Like our players would have certain hairstyles or they say certain things. Like right now, kids call each other bro. It'd be yeah, I know. My daughter and- calls me bro. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. Your daughter <laughs> might call your mom bro. Like that's <laughs> And like so, it was bro for a minute. I could wrap my head around bro, but like now it's like full on bro. I'm like, yeah. we're not doing this. So for Coach Hatchell, she's like, why are they? <laughs> and I got to explain this, right? <laughs> so imagine, you know, imagine that. Old school white lady, like as old school as you can be. Man, that is classic. <laughs> she, no, but she was spunky now. Like, yeah, yeah. Coach Hatchell was a spunky. Man, she you was know, very spunky. She drives 100 miles per hour down the road. Like she's got fight in her still. So, you know, just those little things like that, that's, you know, the world just passes you by if you don't stay connected to the next generation and it's always changing. Yeah, it's interesting because we've had Bobby Kelsey on, you know, she's out of it. Uh, Bridget Pettis was on our show. She's out of it. Crystal Robinson was on. Uh, She sort of got the short end of the stick recently with Dallas, you know, kudos to Vicky, but she, you know, she, she was definitely deserving of an opportunity also. You know, and so you didn't have a passion to, to, to keep going with coaching. The Sports Deli is sponsored by City Lokes. You can get your own personalized hats and much, much more. Check them out at citylokes.com. And don't forget to enter the code the Sports Deli at checkout for your special 10% discount. And now back to this incredible interview right here in the Sports Deli. No. I don't. No. <laughs> I don't miss it. Not even a little bit. Yeah, I can't yeah. wrap my mind around coaching college or any level. I do train. I'm a global coach. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I very much enjoy that. That's the that's the biggest part that I enjoyed about coaching was touching and developing young hearts and minds. The recruiting, the ads, the NCAA rules. I never liked that part of it. And once I got free of that. I, I don't know if I'll ever go back, Mike. I don't want to say never, because um, if it's God's will for me to go back and he creates an unbelievable situation, I may consider it, but I'm taking care of my parents here in Durham, North Carolina. They're 80 years old. I can't even imagine. Oh, bless you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even imagine coaching college and taking care of them now. Mm-hmm. Like COVID changed everything because oh. me being here all day long. Wow. So I can virtually coach some kids from India and Africa right here in Durham, like mm-hmm. right outside at the basketball court outside my house or at my gym. And I do that through e-coach mm-hmm. and I can jump on uh, my birthday twins um, 
library Steph. I mean, Stephen, um, Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr, yeah. We, yeah, we can watch his shooting series. And mm -hmm. then my kids, me and my kids from India will go out and we will do some drills around what he just taught them. And I can teach them from there. Yeah, it's we'll, interesting. Mm -hmm. We'll go watch a series that Doc Rivers is doing and they can pull from my library. I can pull from theirs. And so now what COVID taught us is you don't have to be there every day to coach kids. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, totally. You definitely are impacting lives, whether it's virtually or in person. It's funny because I was working with a future WNBA player recently. Uh, she switched agents. So obviously they're, they got to do things the way they got to do it. And <clears throat> we were watching film and, you know, she played uh, in the Pac-12. And when I watched her game film and I broke it down for her, you know, she obviously was playing out of position. It was just there's so much room for growth on the women's side. You know, the men's side has evolved, you know, a little bit ahead because the game's been around longer. But um, when I, when I was watching film with her, she had never, I mean, four years in the PAC 12 and she's overseas in Spain and people aren't talking to her about some of this stuff. And when I tell you Crystal Bradford's film, I told her everything you do, every Steve Smith, every, every Hezzy, every decision that you made in that highlight video is is so exact and i haven't been able to find one complete highlight video to show people how i teach the game and i don't do much in the areas of defense and things like that like if people come to me i'm a shooting expert and i'm a, and I'm a professional skills trainer so you know i'm teaching them hezzy and change of efficiency and things like that and so if I ever got back to the college game after coaching for 23 years, right, I was on the men's side 15 years, and then 15th year on the women's side, that's the, that's the area, like, like you said, you want to pour into them as, as people, you know, in, in, in their hearts, and, you know, you're passionate about that. And, you know, I asked Val Whiting about this when she came on, she's a good friend of mine now, and, and she just said she thinks she'll lose the ability to empower girls the way that she's empowering them through TikTok. And, and, and so you have to follow your compass, right? You have to do it. But man, I, there's, I enjoyed watching film with her so much to show her the decisions she was making when she caught the ball in the perimeter, what she was doing in the open floor. And like, if I ever got back to the college level, like that's, I want to be the, the, the skills trainer, the player development coach. And, you know, obviously I love people. You can tell by, you know, doing this kind of thing that I enjoy getting to know families and stuff like that. But there are, there is a lot of red tape and a lot of stuff that's just not fun you know, when you're coaching at the college level, for sure. Yeah, I, I think the players now have the upper hand because it's about the student athlete experience, which for sure. so. But shouldn't know, it be that way? Shouldn't it be more about the whole the whole person? It should. It should. And, and I can see it from I have a 3D view of the game, Mike, because I played and coached simultaneously in one year. I was one of seven who played, I had a nine month coaching contract at, U, at UNC. That was my first coaching job. Mm -hmm. And I had a three month playing contract with Portland Fire in the WNBA. So for one year, I got to switch hats and I can, I can switch it just like that. So interesting. I can hear, I can hear something in a staff meeting. <laughs> I can hear it through the filter of a player. Wow. And the fact that I coached at the school that I play, I played for these coaches, right? So our staff could say something and I would say, let me tell you what I heard as a player who played for Coach Hatchell. Mm -hmm. Because this happened, you were saying that this is my fault. They're like, we didn't say it's your fault. I said, that's how I'm taking it. And trump me, feel free to trump me if you ever play for Coach Hatchell in this room. I'm the only one. I'm telling you what I hear you saying. So I was able to like put my player's hat on. I said, so we've got to figure out a way to say this where we don't feel, we don't make this their fault because now it becomes them against us. Right. So mm -hmm. because I can like switch it on mm -hmm. and off like that, it gives me such an advantage, I think. Mm -hmm. you know? And so when you make this about the student athletes experience, the player in me feels like it should have always been like this. Right. But the coach in me sees how that is detrimental to the actual student athletes in some instances, because. So what we talked about earlier, like about pushing through, not just going to the transfer portal and having an easy yeah. way out, not grinding yeah. excuses. Yeah. yeah, right yeah. 23 suicides made me a national champion right, because totally. it made me mentally tough. But today 
that's abuse, right? Mm -hmm. The student athlete is not having a good experience and you are an abusive coach. And now that kid's either going to transfer or they're going to turn you into the AD and the AD is going to fire you. Yeah. So now you're being mean to me. You're abusive, right? Or you don't start me. I'm leaving. This is like, you're, mm -hmm. if you have kids, Mike. I mean, UConn just lost two kids, right? Yeah, but let's say you've got kids of your own in your family, right? Mm -hmm. You discipline your kids. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're being disrespectful to their mom. You take their phone away. You take away some of their privileges. You <laughs> punish them. And now they're like, you're being mean to me. I right. don't want to be in this family anymore. I'm calling social services. Exactly. And they, you know, they're a kid. They don't know what's best for them. All they know is you took their phone. They can't play their video games. They can't watch WWE at night and you're a bad guy. And there's a difference between berating a kid, right? Standing face to face with them, you know, and screaming at them. And like, there, there's just things that we know that are different between what you're talking about and, and, you know, having, a having a culture. Line. Well, it is a fine, certain things are a fine line, but there are some clear lines of demarcation. There are all of these things. There are. But 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 you make okay. a good point about the, the shift in the culture and, and the expectations. You know? I think coaches tend to coach the way they were raised and disciplined. Absolutely. You know what I mean? If you were raised with tough love, mm -hmm. you don't quit. Like I got spankings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I if I acted out at the mall, I got disciplined at the mall. Like if I came in out in front of, of everybody. I came out of my mouth at the mall. I got popped in my mouth at the mall in front of my friends. That was acceptable behavior for my parents. And what it taught me is if I act out at the mall or the football game or anywhere, my parents don't care where we at, I will get popped. So mm -hmm. guess what I did not do? Act out in public, not with my parents, right? There were immediate consequences. Mm -hmm. So as a coach, I can recall a time I was at Boston College. I had a player who said, coach, I want to play in the WNBA, right? They're excited <laughs> that I'm there because I'm a former WNBA player. Okay, I know what it takes to play on this level. And I'm going to push you and hold you accountable to what you say you want to do, right? So after this meeting, I find that this player is averaging about mm, five rebounds a game, post player. I'm like, I don't think you can make it to the league averaging four to five rebounds a game when you're capable of doing more. So I decided not to start this player one game. I said, she's comfortable. We got to shake her up. If she's going to make it to the league, she, she got to turn it on right now in order to have decent stats by the end of the year to go to the league, right? And this is not a selfish goal. The team will be a better team if right. she gets more rebounds, right? We'll win more games. So I made a decision. So this was her first ever in her career not starting. I didn't know this. I inherited this team, right? And so, I mean, I think I knew it, but I didn't realize it was such a big deal in her mind. I'm just trying to make her better. Gino mm -hmm. does this all the time. Sat team yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles down, didn't play her, and look where she is now. It worked. Mm -hmm. So I use this method to make her better. <laughs> you know, it's, and it's not that she's not, she was capable of doing more, right? Yeah, yeah, more rebounding drills to help her get better at that. So I get interviewed by the media. They want to know, why didn't you start this player? I said, well, I just think she's better than four rebounds a game. And so I'm challenging her. Um, I, I mean, I, I think she's capable of giving us more than what she's given us. And she set some goals and I'm trying to help her reach those goals. And when she makes it up in her mind and she wants to rebound, absolutely. She'll get her starting position back. I saw nothing wrong with that, Mike. Well, guess what? To that player, I totally betrayed her. I totally, because I, that was symbolic of, I smacked her in the face at the mall. To the media, I said this. And you and I would have been like, for real? Yeah. Okay. So, and I didn't find this out after that. She did not make eye contact with me. Her mm. parents didn't make eye contact. Now, prior to this, they would wait for me after every game, win mm. or lose. Hey, coach, yeah. they bring me cookies and stuff. Now there's no cookies. There's no eye contact. I'm like, what the heck? So now, I mean, and she started playing better. She was mad about it, but she, and it totally worked. She started playing better. She got her starting position back. We're now winning, right? But later- She I felt had, betrayed. 
I've later had a discussion with her mom and her mom said, mm. I, we were talking about, I said, yeah, if I acted out at the mall, my mom would smack me right at the mouth at the mall. And, and her mom said, what? Oh no, I would never do that to my daughter. I said, mm. what would you do? She said, I would take her in a bathroom to keep the relationship intact. I said, with your daughter? You keep the relationship <laughs> intact with your daughter, like a friendship? She was that like, about sums it up right there. Yeah, she said, and I take her back there and I let her have, and I say, listen, young lady, you don't do that. And then we go back to the mall. I said, huh? My mom would have smacked me right there at the mall. Yeah. <laughs> and then the light bulb was off for me. Yep. Sylvia, mm -hmm. you smacked her in the face at the mall when you mm -hmm. said publicly to the media why she wasn't starting. She wanted me to bring her in the office and announce to her first that she wasn't going to start. And then when I was asked by the media, protect her to keep the relationship intact, not say this, not say why she didn't start, even though they're asking me this question and protect her to keep that relationship intact. So I call bullshit. It wouldn't have mattered. But this is what I'm saying. Coaches tend to coach how they were raised. Like yeah, yep. my idea of discipline is how I was disciplined. Yep. Right. So in Boston College, there was definitely a cultural difference. At Ohio University, white and black kids, I related to them very well. This is why Dawn Staley, I believe, she is in the best culture for her. Philly was good for her. Mm. South Carolina is good for her. You put Dawn Staley in Massachusetts, <laughs> you put her in California. Mm. I do not know that Dawn can do what she's doing right now, the way she's done it. She's in the right environment where the way she was disciplined, <laughs> I, I never forget. I was recruiting with Dawn. I said, Dawn, there's a little point guard over here. Come over here and look at her. She's like, I don't want that point guard, Crawley. I'm looking for knuckleheads. I said, what? She said, yeah, that girl ain't a knucklehead. She's too nice. I won't be able to cuss that kid out in the huddle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and she not break. She said, I was a knucklehead when I was younger. I need kids that I can relate to. I'm looking for knuckleheads. I said, oh, well, don't look at her. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. meanwhile, like every coach in the country was in that court. Mm -mm. Dawn's looking for knuckleheads. So because of how she was disciplined and how she was raised, that's how she coaches. Mm -hmm. Gino coaches the way he was disciplined. That's why he didn't play Tina Charles. That's mm -hmm. why he humbles those kids, right? You saw the story of his life. When I watched it, it made sense why he coaches the way he does. And so that's it in a nutshell. So when the older you get, the more your style of discipline of how your parents raise you is out of date with this generation of kids. That's what's going on. Yeah. So the younger the coach, I think the more chances of they, they are being in touch with this generation, plus mm. the way that they were disciplined. You now have yeah. coaches that are young enough where they got sent to timeout. They didn't get popped in the face at the mall. <laughs> right. Those coaches can make it with these type of kids because these type of kids have learned how to impeach the president, defund the police. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they've learned how to buck authority. You're mm. the authoritative figure. They don't have to respect you. They don't have to respect the police. They don't have to respect it. You can now talk about the president like a dog on social media and get away with it. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen years ago. You weren't allowed to talk about the president, insult the president, or say, I wish the president would die, stuff like that. You can say stuff like that. Now you can. You can voice your opinion about anybody. I don't care who they are. But on the, on the flip side, though, you can get a weight room in one day when the women are disrespected and you can change an election and you can be at the forefront of advocating for change and social injustice and, and systemic racism. So and it does go both ways. And you can get student ap athletes compensated for their likeness. That's correct. There, there's great things that have come out of this. Like we've come so far. However, there's a fine line, Mike. Mm -hmm. Fine line. And I feel you. So this is why I choose to just virtually coach. You come mm -hmm. to me because you want what I have to offer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You want to be coached hard. You want to be mentored by me. You want what I have to offer versus me coach some kids that like, I feel like kids don't need us. They got Google. They don't need us for information. They'll Google mm -hmm. it. They'll YouTube it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I but I can you. tell you this from a player development standpoint, 
uh, my best friend's coaching at Kansas State, and I've seen enough ball where they are not emphasizing across the board player development in a way where you know they're making those players better versions of themselves on the floor. Part of it is the old school, and part of it is the new school. And you know you can be a system program like Tara, you know, but but the kids need to have better tools in their toolbox, I think, on the court because some of their decision making is frustrating to watch. I'm like, what is that? Yeah, because they're learning from YouTube. They're watching videos. They're making videos, right? Right. And what's lacking is defense. So now they, they don't know how to read because they're mm -hmm. doing all this training. And, and so, like, I'm not doing a whole lot of virtual coaching right now because these kids are in school. They're being coached by their high school coaches or their college coaches. And so I, I feel like some kids can be overcoached. You got your parents yeah. in the stand screaming stuff. You got your coach that you play for right now screaming stuff and you got your trainer in the stands screaming stuff. And that kid looks like they have never played basketball day in their life. Why yeah. overcoach and confuse? Who do I listen to? Well, I like what Gino said. He always said, I like trainers, but I want them to learn how to win. I don't care what you're, you're teaching them, but incorporate countdowns, you know, have consequences for any drill because then you're teaching, teaching them how to win. Let, let me ask you about, uh, how you felt the women of the W handled. Um, Cause I just had a uh, uh, Kelsey trainer on, she's a lawyer and she has some uh, relationships with WNBA player, Sue Bird and others and talked about the story about how um, they started the ball rolling and getting um, the former owner of the uh, Atlanta dream, um, the politician whose name eludes me right now, but I'll think of it. Uh, Kelly Leffler. Mm -hmm. And how, how they started that whole campaign to get her out and change uh, Reverend Warnock's, uh, you know, outcome. And, you know, I don't want another murder to happen and is why we shifted on the show and talk about a lot of these important issues, mental health, et cetera, because uh, as, a, as an ally, as an unapologetic ally, as a, because I feel like it's, it's a big white issue still. Because uh, white people still run things in, in, in large part in society and in sports and intercollegiate athletics. And so we're, we're, we're approaching two years removed from the pandemic starting and a year and a half after George Floyd. And so we're, you've had time to digest all of this. You know, and we're, we're, where do you think we are in terms of progress, you know, uh, after the wobble and, you know, where we are with this, this whole thing of uh, allies and white people speaking out more and what the WNBA did. And, you know, have we relaxed too much at this point or are we still doing uh, a lot of good in that space? The Sports Deli is sponsored by PSK Collective. Their women's clothing line promotes inclusivity, empowerment, and equality. Check them out online at pskcollective.com, tjmax.com, walmart.com, and lids. Dot com. And now back to this incredible interview right here in the sports deli. I think we're doing a lot of good. Um, I was very proud. I saw the movie um, that the W did, the mm -hmm. players that W did and how they came together. 144? Yeah, yeah. I was very proud of my little sisters when I watched that movie because they um, figured out a way to come together and provoke change, you know, in their own way. And um, they made some noise, you know, they, they made some noise with a t-shirt and being silent. Isn't that ironic? Mm -hmm. The power yeah. of a t-shirt and the power of not saying someone's name. Mm -hmm. And I like your shirt, by the way, I'm digging it. <laughs> um, cause it is bigger than ball, but just, mm -hmm. you know, when you see what Maya Moore did and some of the other players, she wasn't the only one, right. <laughs> um, it makes me very proud that they're they're choosing to use their platform, but they stuck together, you know? Right, strength in numbers. Yeah, in the past, mm -hmm. there have been other people who have tried, but they right. kind of did it on their own. And because of that, they were ostracized. They were blackballed. They were, and it made others behind them afraid to take the stand, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas when they did it collectively, and what I was most proud of is our brothers from the NBA backed them. Absolutely. Right. So now you're, you, you can't, you cannot come down on them because LeBron is coming, you know, Kevin Durant is coming, Curry is coming. So 
the, yeah, the the guy I love the the unity between the NBA mm-hmm. and WNBA. Powerful. Right? Yeah, very powerful. But it just it just goes to show that they're learning from history mm-hmm. because if you don't know your history, it will repeat itself. Mm-hmm. So they learn from that and they took that and they moved that forward. So um, lately, have we relaxed? I think there's even more that we can do. But I think by taking the stand, they were able to do some good. They were able to bring visibility to the WNBA. And that led right into the 25th anniversary of the WNBA. Some really good things happened this year that I was very proud of Mm -hmm. in terms of women's sports. There's some stuff coming up the pipeline. I just got a call today about a documentary on women, the history of women's sports. Yeah, so we're having them as our first episode of season three, episode one, uh, history of the ball inc.org. Everybody check that out because those women are coming on our show, part mm-hmm. of that documentary. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, there's some exciting things. We wanna just make sure that this is here for a very long time that there is a professional league for the collegiate players to go to for years to come. Like, I just remember for years and years, we felt like, I don't know how long it's going to last, you know? Um, And here we are 25 years later and it's still here. And it's well, and the NBA, you know, definitely stepped up and and supported it and funded it, you know, to, to make it long, long lasting. And kudos to them for doing that because I, I think, you know, I don't even think we make the money. They're in the red. So well, they used to be in the red. They they they're they're grossing in the uh, sixty now. millions now. But yeah, initially, absolutely, they were. They do it just because they want to see us have these opportunities. So people are like, right. "I should make more money. Why don't you?" And yes, we should make more money. Women should make more money in the WNBA. But I can understand that, like the same people who are saying that. When is the last time you've been to a game? They don't make more money. We need more support. We need more people to buy merchandise. We need more people to be season ticket holders. Even if there's not a team in your town, like there are, there are people who are NBA fans who don't live in a city of an NBA town, but they are season ticket holders. Right. So that is showing their monetary support. Right. Absolutely. So until we can see that it's, it's hard for the women to make more money. And yeah. I, a part of that, a big part of that, I think was just, just licensing that was absolutely here, television mm-hmm. yeah, there were some trades that happened they switched some stuff around candace parker went to the sky now you've got mm-hmm. to tune in to see candace in a blue and yellow jersey i wanted to see it how's this gonna work? How's the chemistry going to work with those personalities like you had to tune in and there were other ways to tune in you could watch it on facebook you could watch it on twitter like the visibility was like no other this year so I think we've come a long way. I'm very proud of some things that I've seen happen within the last couple of years. Awesome. Still got a ways to go. Yep. Expansions coming uh, and roster sizes will increase probably next collective bargaining, which is uh, absolutely pertinent. And then uh, additional things with. uh, with, Coming up. Yes. And, and, you know, uh, charter flights, like there just needs to be some other things that, that the women deserve, you know, but, with the, but there's still a lot of progress that have been made. Let me ask you about this. Asia Wilson, you know, Kevin Love, uh, DeMar DeRozan, um, Meta World Sanford uh, have come out and she talked about visibility, have shed a lot of visibility on mental health. And so there's this fine line, right? Because Val Whiting has come on and she's been honest about, you know, uh, the culture that was at Stanford and some of the old school coaches, they weren't in tune necessarily with mental health back then. You know, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're an outcast or you're not behaving, get on the line. And so mental health is real and we're trying to normalize it. And so my father committed suicide when I was nine and, you know, and, you know, but, you know, you, you, you pour into sports and sports pours into you and, and, you know, uh, things save you. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for those spaces and trying to pour into people now in my 30 year career, um, you know, in large part because of trauma and right trauma is supposed to give you a greater sense of clarity in life. But if it's not being addressed uh, in a mainstream kind of way and it's being pushed aside or under the carpet or, you know, ignored then you don't feel like you can be in a safe space, just like we're trying to create here. And so uh, how was it back, back then? Because, you know, we've seen people commit suicide. We, we, we see people all the time going through very difficult times, homeless, 
you know, navigating these spaces and people like Liz and, and others have shed a light on this. And do you think we're, we're doing a better job now intercollegiately and professionally and, and trying to help normalize this? Because especially in the black and brown community, we've talked about this a lot on the show, you know, you're either roasted, you know, if, if you got some mental health issues or you're, you know, you're an outcast in the family, you know, so it's a, it's a delicate thing, right? Yeah, it's very delicate, and especially in the African American community, and especially in sports. Right. Because you're taught to be tough and suck it up. And Mm -hmm. there are many players who were injured over the years, but you're expected to just tough it out and play injured. And now, when you're my age and it's raining outside and you can't get out, (laughs) and the women still have a pension. So mm-hmm. we don't get paid for tendonitis and any, any little aches and pains that we have. Michael Jordan, when he can't get out of bed, he's being compensated to this day, right? So, you know, there's nobody there when you get older to say, thank you for sucking it up. Nobody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you make a decision to protect your body, you're being selfish to the team. That's right. how you're made to feel, right? Or you hear about the same thing emotionally too though right you're being selfish if you're like misbehaving or you know and so you talk about that delicate balance right you're like are you seeking attention or are you really like upset and going through going through it and suicidal right i I remember when i heard that um vivian stringer had stepped down for um from exhaustion and I remember the reactions of the African-American community, like, what? Every Black person's exhausted. You don't get to step down, you know? Like, that mm-hmm. kind of stems from, like, just slavery days and then post-slavery days. And, you know, you, you dealt with a whole lot, you know? You might have seen your friend get lynched, but you still didn't, you know, like, you still had to yeah, keep yeah. the family going. And you just endure, 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 and you just tough it out and somehow we as a culture of black people have survived all of this, right? Right. We take pride in that. So if you show any sign of weakness or say, I can't do this, or I'm exhausted, I need a break. That's unheard of. (laughs) It Mm. really, really is. It's becoming now more and more acceptable. I think once COVID hit Mm. and everybody started dealing with, you know, um, mental health issues right because it just became very taxing on everybody so Mm -hmm. now i think with people stepping out and people saying you know look i'm not okay and people posting it's okay to not be okay check on your friends check on everybody so now it's becoming more and more acceptable and i'm so happy that it is because Mm -hmm. now people can just be honest and say look i'm not well Mm -hmm. and rather than have a mentally ill coach continue to coach i'd rather them step down and let somebody who's able to do it do it right and let them get the rest that they need so that they can be whole and well so it is um it's a fine line you have a lot of players who um are bipolar you Mm -hmm. have a lot of players who are schizophrenic a lot of players who are adhd they're on they're highly medicated right and people forget these kids are student athletes, right? So they got to pass a test that they got to pass to be eligible sometimes. So now the doctors got to tweak their medicine a little bit so they can focus to pass this class. But because they tweaked the medicine and what time they took it, now for the game, they're right. a little bit off, right? And so what is that? That kid's in the middle of all that. Yeah. Now the coach is screaming at them or they're, and they may have some behavior problems throwing water bottles or whatever, and the coach is coming at them, not realizing this kid had to adjust their meds just to pass the test mm. for them today, right? Yeah. So I've experienced that as a coach. And now mm-hmm. it's exhausting for me as a coach to try to juggle all this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Trained in psychology. Right. It was exhausting for me. So you got all of these different components going on on a sports Whew. team. Yeah. In addition to you being African-American where it's not accepted for this to happen, you know, Mm -hmm. like this, that's a lot. That is a Mm -hmm. lot. So it's definitely something that needs to be addressed, Mm -hmm. that needs to be brought to the attention of everybody to be aware of it, be more sensitive to it um, and be educated on how to deal with it. I I think Mm -hmm. teachers now need that kind of training. We're required to take PR classes and pass that. We're Thank you. We're required to learn all of these NCAA rules that change every five minutes. 
how do you keep up with that, right? So there needs to be something in place for every, every team should have a sports psychologist, every team. Because not only are you dealing like basketball, in my opinion, is more than 80% mental. Of course. Right? Absolutely. So if your mind is not right, how, how are we expecting them to compete? Every team should have a sports psychologist. Pay and, they, and they don't. And, and then profes- in the professional ranks across the board with all sports professional leagues, you know, I've been told this by the guests on our show, it's still not mandated across the board. And that's, that's just mind blowing to me. I appreciate you you know, sharing that thoughtful perspective. Uh, all right, let's get to the rapid fire. Go ahead, finish. You had one more thought. Well, every WNBA team that I played for had a sports psychologist and I took mm-hmm. full advantage of that. I, I, That's I, I, awesome. Performance enhancing type of um, sports psychology. So just one, I'll give you one example. I had no routine because I'm a Christian and I felt like I don't want to be superstitious. So if I don't get my 500 shots in the shoot around, I don't want to feel like I'm going to have a bad game. So I would just do random stuff every time I had a game. And the sports psychologist was mm-hmm. like, no. But wait, did you have a, in that same vein, you had a routine at the foul line for your free throw, right? Yeah, I did. Okay. I but on game day, I didn't have a routine on game day yeah 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 no i understand like you you know you get there an hour before you know you, you roll your socks up you know you go to the bathroom like <laughs> whatever it is. Every time. i wouldn't do the same thing so the sports psychologist helped me to understand listen having a routine has nothing to do with superstition it just programs your mind and your body to say it's game day and i'm going to perform on this high level every single time that's how michael jordan is consistent mm-hmm. why you see lebron go and put the powder in his hand and go like this every game because it's programming his mind to be here elite every single day. Yes. i was here here i would have 20 points interesting five points like if you look at my average in the WNBA, it might say nine points right but mm-hmm. i have some games where i scored 25 and was player of the game and I have some nights where I tanked out and I have four points, right? Mm. So I went to see a sports psychologist and she said, okay, when you had 25 points last week, what did you eat? I was like, I had chicken fettuccine. She said, you need to eat chicken fettuccine before every game, some kind of pasta, right? She's like, what did you do? I took a pregame nap for an hour. She's like, you need to take a pregame nap for an hour. Mm. I would shoot around and I took this many shots, right? So we programmed exactly what I did and I started creating that routine and it's hmm. my game tremendously wow tremendously. interesting yeah so that's cool but that's just one side of the mental aspect yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in terms of your absolutely performance, right but if you're dealing with any other kind of chemical imbalances you need a sports psychologist for those things for chemistry totally. for culture for all of that stuff college and pros not just pros colleges the schools have money from NCAAs, right? You got some sport that's doing well, whether it's hockey or football, they need to put that back into the athletic department and not just a sports psychologist for the athletic department. Each team needs their own. Absolutely. That's a job in and of itself for each player. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Well, and and I think you you said it best. A lot of it is your upbringing. There are chemical imbalances, but man, the way you were raised you know, if you were playing street ball versus AAU all the time, what your parents did, what your grandma, your auntie did, your brothers and sisters, you know, it, it, it all impacts you. And, and oftentimes you don't realize it until later, you know, but it, your childhood, your upbringing and how you approach the world and the, the lens that you see things, man. And that, and that, like you said, that's why it's tough for coaches a lot of times now, because you have so many different backgrounds and upbringings and philosophies on you know, what should be happening to bring the team together. And it's, it just makes it even more amazing on some level. Mike, now we've added international players. Some teams have more international players than domestic players from the U.S., right? Absolutely. Now there's like a melting pot of different cultures and nationalities and the upbringings from those places. Well, and if the coaches aren't willing to be flexible, forget it. Like they're just, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to sink. They ain't going to swim. Yeah. And then you've got junior college players coming um, in from a whole different culture. Transfer and portal. Now you've got, and we had our first homeschooled kid ever at Carolina. Wow. Add that to the pot. <laughs> <laughs> Who had never listened to secular music, had no social media, 
and you throw them in with a bunch of kids and say, all right, it's midnight madness. You're going to dance. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've never danced before. What are you talking about? Right. So that's crazy. All right. Let's get to the rapid fire. Uh, uh, Pat or Gino? <laughs> I'm a fan of Pat. Yeah. Pat. Pat helped me get my job at Boston College. I didn't even know her. Wow. And, uh, yeah, That's they were cool. looking for an upcoming coach that was um, that could be the face of the program. Mm. And they ran a bunch of names by Pat. And when they said my name, she said, no, she's sharp. She And she knew my record at Ohio University. Mm. She, she, and I didn't think, like, she's Pat Summit. I didn't think she was even mm. paying attention to me. And when wow. I got the job, they told me that Pat spoke very highly of me. So I called her and thanked her. And she said, Sylvia, wow. if you need anything, feel free to call me anytime. And she became my mentor as I was a head coach at Boston College. Well, that's fascinating. I know Bridget worked for her also. She's at Kansas State right now. And uh, uh, she works with Stacy, who I was talking about earlier, who worked for Heidi mm -hmm. uh, here at UCSD and Tara in the summers as a commissioner at, at Tara's camp. And I think that was a reason why she got the job over 500 people. It does matter who you know. It once does. you're in the door, you got to do some stuff once you're inside the door. But yep. yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, how good is Paige? Paige is really good. <laughs> she does so many things well. I like really enjoy Oof. her play and her confidence level. Like that's the biggest thing. You, you can learn all these skills and how all these trainers, but if you don't have the confidence to execute that against anybody, then that, you, you've done all that work for nothing. So that that's the part that I enjoy about her most, I think, is just her confidence level. She doesn't back down uh, anybody. And, you know, she reminds me of Steph Curry a lot because Steph Curry had a reputation when he was in the league early on that he was a nice guy. And then he started putting the mouth guard sideways in his mouth and bumping people and cussing people out and saying, you know, doing things to the crowd. And you can sort of see that with Paige. She's incrementally starting to get an edge to her. Because, you know, she, everyone thought she was just real nice and everything. And now, she, you know, she's doing the tiger fist pump. And just like, you can just see, like, she's got that next level competitive spirit in her. Yeah. I, I don't think you got to curse and be, you know, do all this stuff. But I do think you. No, but if you're disrespected, like, you have to say, like, I got a, I got a rough side, too. Yeah, I think in order to be on top and stay on top. I mean, I know a lot of players that were on top because maybe the league pushed them to be the golden child and they right. got all the endorsements and they were on all the commercials, but they couldn't handle like in the games, people were coming at that player like, oh, you got this kind of endorsement. You got you signed this much on the contract. Oh, I'm going to show the league. I should be making this much. Right. Mm -hmm. And They were taking beat down every game and couldn't handle it, got injured and you never saw them play again. Interesting. So I think in order to be on top and stay on top, you either have to have two, you got to have one or two things, swagger or a chip on your shoulder. Steph or Curry both. A chip. Yeah, he has a chip or he had a chip. I think now he's got a little swag. But mm. the chip was he came from Davidson. He was small. Yeah. He was skinny. You know what I mean? Like he's just this, this little kid from Davis. And who is this kid? Right. And nobody was shooting from that range back then either. So people were like, that's a bad shot. <laughs> right, right follow the shot rules <laughs> that was not a good shot so yeah can you imagine playing in an era where they're shooting 25 footers and it's okay mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> that is just and the women are going to follow suit oh yeah they, they just are eventually i mean they just move the line you know to to match the men's and stuff like that so yeah it's it's very interesting the shift and to see steph take it to another level like he was already at a level. He was already, already transformational. And this year he was like, he was just pissed. And they don't even have clay. No. It's fascinating. That's more shots for him though. <laughs> it is more shots for him. But it just shows you that he is a, capable of carrying a team. Yeah. So I think Paige is, she's getting a chip on her shoulder. She is. So I agree. Paige for her is to add swag to that. I mean, she gets Absolutely. Swag for the chip. <laughs> Uh, Cheryl or Lisa? <laughs> I'm going to go with Lisa only because I played against her. Like Cheryl, I've switched off screens and had to guard Cheryl and was like, holy smokes, what the heck, yeah. am, I, what the heck am I doing out here? Um, 
but Lisa had a um she just had a tenacity to yeah. her um that was nasty yeah she was nasty she was Absolutely. nasty but that's what made her great you know what it, I mean like it is. I'll never forget she um and her and I we both went to Pete Newell's big man's camp I don't know if you remember that uh, heck yeah of course but everybody it, who was everybody went to that <laughs> you it was six five and up so yep. Lisa and I were the point guards there and we had like some centers that were 6'10 and Ann Donovan was our coach, right? Amazing. So Lisa and I come from the Pete Newell School of Post Play. We mm -hmm. got the same moves, the step backs, the spin moves, all of that. We got the same package. So it was very hard for me to score on her. She knew how to stop that because those were her moves and vice versa. So anytime we played each other, it was a complete cat fight. Like, listen, Mike. I found out that there were no fouls on a jump ball back when I played because they would throw the ball up and Lisa would grab me by my face and tip the ball with the other hand, like <laughs> nails going down my face. And I, was, I would be at the jump ball like, that's a foul. They're like, there's no foul on a jump ball. So the next time we played the Sparks, <laughs> we, was the, we was at the jump ball line like, I'm going to get you before you get me. I'm, and we're saying this with our eyes. They threw the ball up. We didn't even hit the ball. We hit the ground fighting. <laughs> oh, shit. Double, double technical. like. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, listen, for the jump ball, though, there's no fouls. And right. we always got double techs during the game. Like, that that's is, how it was just like, wow. That is classic. But, but there were times where she would do a spin move and clip me with yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit me in the face and score. And I would fall down. And she's, like, literally step on me on her way down the court. <laughs> <laughs> And I was looking at the ref like, do you see her foot on my neck right now? You know, like, you weren't getting that call. You know what I mean? She was one of the marquee players. So, um, oh my goodness. You know, just her, her will to win. Yeah, yeah. How she got everybody on her team to elevate to her level was incredible. Like, her leadership was incredible to see and witness. That's awesome. Hope to get her on. Auntie's been trying, but she's she's busy. So if you want to co-host with me and wink, wink, you know, hook that up. Let's get the goat on. Uh, Diana or Maya? I'd have to say it pains me to say this because I love Maya more. Like, I just think she's such a mm. unique player. But I'm yeah. going to have to go Diana Taurasi. This, yeah. year, this year would make me vote for her and what I saw her do. Yeah, it's cool to see both of their transformation, Diana as a mom and Maya as a, you know, an activist and what she's done, you know, and with her, now. <laughs> and a, yeah, and as a wife and, a, and her, as a current husband who she helped, uh, you know, uh, who was unjustly in jail for so long, you know, who she met when she was 18, just that whole story is amazing. LeBron or MJ? Wait, let me go back to Diana. Oh, yes, ma'am. Maya, um, I, I would, I like her character, who mm -hmm. she is and how she did it, but stay true to who she is. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do. So I admire her for that. But Diana Taurasi, she has this refuse to lose, bump you kind of attitude. That's and sort of the Lisa Leslie school of uh, you know, <laughs> tenacity. Yeah. She's in that category with Cynthia Cooper mm -hmm. in terms of confidence level in terms of um you know what i mean like you you almost have to have that to be the best of the best absolutely That's mj common. Yeah. kobe you yeah, know kobe. so um you could say what you want to about them but they that they have it they definitely they have, have it. it yeah yeah so what was the next one you said lebron or mj i'm biased Okay, Mike, so I MJ. <laughs> uncle, that's Uncle Mike right there. Um, so what would what would shift it if if uh, LeBron won two more rings? Would that shift it for you? Um, I'm gonna go with LeBron, but because he's won it with different teams because of his longevity. I mean. No, no, no. I, I think there's something to be said to win it with the same team mm -hmm. and stay loyal to the same team. For sure. However, in today's day and age, that's not seen as something good anymore. 
Like right. if you stay on the same job for more than five years, you're there too long now. That's just not the way our society is. That yeah. we're in a world that's always changing. The new Jordans, the new Michael Kors bag, the new, your phone updates, you got the new iPhone. Yeah. You know, like, Even so, Tom Brady. Yeah. yeah. So, so because of that, what LeBron is doing is acceptable, but I still admire Jordan for staying with the Bulls and retiring yeah. the Bulls. But um, I'm picking LeBron just because overall, like he's just an overall humanitarian. Yeah, of great. course. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he uses his platform for good more mm. than any other athlete that I know right now. Facts. So if I could add in the off the court stuff too, LeBron hands down. Hands down. That's why I've been so critical of Tom Brady and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole today because I've gone down at almost every show. Uh, all right, let's crank these out. Waffles, French toast, or pancakes? <laughs> All day long. French, French toast. toast. Yeah. Have you ever had French toast with challah? Mm -mm. Okay. So it's gotta, it's gotta be one of the things that you try. It's this thicker Jewish bread. It will change your life even more. Oh, I think I've had that. I just didn't know the name. Yeah. Challah bread. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's amazing. Candy or popcorn at the movies? Popcorn. I'm butter. a salt. I don't crave sugar. I crave salt. Mm. So butter though? Butter. Mm. Yeah. But Inst I like I like car caramel. Ooh. Mm. I like caramel and cheese mix, a Chicago mix. Ooh. I like to trick my taste buds. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't like the sweets, but then you get <laughs> uh, inside yeah, the end. Yeah, go ahead. I like that because there's salt in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. No, I get it. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. It's like the, uh, what is that candy that has the 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 salt and the and the uh, and the chocolate or whatever it is? Yeah, I like that balance. Inside the NBA, Kenny, Shaq, Charles, or Ernie? I like Kenny, but I like Shaq. Listen, Shaq is killing the game right now. Man. Shaq is the high. Shaq got more endorsements than current oh NBA God. players right now. Yeah, I love what I him and Magic. Are doing. And he has a personality of like a box of rocks, really. Totally. <laughs> um, Shaquille and Mills. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, he does have personality plus. Like he's funny. He's witty. He can rap. Yeah, he's uh, so funny. Yeah, I, I I think I'm I'm a fan of Kenny. Kenny's a Carolina guy. I'm biased. Absolutely. But I'm gonna go with Shaq. All right. Jeffersons are good times. I'm a Jeffersons person. My whole family is good times. <laughs> but by the time I came along, the Jeffersons was becoming more popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's like me. I'm a couple years older than you. Uh, all in the family or Sanford and Son? Sanford and Son. Better food in Boston, Indy, or New York? I would say New York. Mm. Better would... food in Ohio or Chapel Hill, North Carolina? Mm. Well, there's your Midwest question ish. Uh, I would say Ohio, not Chapel Hill, just, yeah. or just North Carolina. Well, yeah, I was saying Chapel Hill, basically. Yeah. Chapel Hill, no, I'm voting for Ohio, but after Saturday, I'm voting for Chapel Hill. I just invested into a soul food seafood place that will Ooh. open Franklin Street, and the grand hey. opening is on Saturday. It's called hey. Seafood Destiny Express. Wait, wait, what's the name of it so everybody can check it out? Seafood Destiny Express. Oh, my God. Why wasn't it's, it there when I was there? Oh, my God. This is unbelievable. They have two other franchises in um, Greensboro and a food truck oh. doing very well. Typically, I don't I don't invest in restaurants because it's such a bad investment. But yeah. this one will kill the game in Chapel Hill and it stays open till one o'clock. Oh, heck yeah. The clubs in and the you studying for an exam. You, you hungry? Go to Franklin. No, not, not hungry. 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 <laughs> across the street from top of the hill, like prime spot. Oh, and my God. Available because of COVID, right? People had to close down. There's like three places open on Franklin Street. That never happens. People wow. Because the money's so good, but. Oh, yeah. I love seafood, man. Yeah, I saw a game there. Uh, my former player, Community College, uh, she went to Presbyterian. And so they're, they were supposed to play in the women's facility, but it was being renovated. And so they played in the Dean Dome. So I went to the game and watched her in the Dean Dome. She dropped 10 on Carolina that night. And they were ranked fifth in the country at the time uh Carolina won but it was amazing to watch that game and my former player you know 
uh, play against Carolina. It was, it was, it was awesome. Then I went to Duke, uh, later that day and snuck into Cameron indoor. And that's a whole nother story just to check Cameron indoor out. So that's crazy. Um, let's see, Stu, uh, or any of the old school players, if you had to choose one player to start a team. Brianna Stewart, you mean? Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> and any old school player like Lisa Leslie, yeah, Jackson, maybe? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, different eras, different kind of player. Yeah. Um, and I was the coach. I would start a franchise with Lisa or Lauren Jackson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stewie's but, good. Don't get me wrong. I recruit just different. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very different. They're and like. If you see her parents, you're like, where did you come from? <laughs> her parents aren't even tall. Like, she's just. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And her skill is like, she does things that's just innate. You could tell, like, nobody taught her how to do this. Gina like KD. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just can do it. But I don't know. I, I like the tenacity of a Lauren Jackson. She was nasty. Totally. Lisa Leslie. I mean, they're winners. I think you, they've won championships. You, you, and so has Stewie, but. Mm, Just different. Yeah. You like the old school kind of. Yeah. yeah. But give Stewie another five years. Yeah. 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 We'll be there. For sure. Yeah. Overcoming that injury too. Yeah. That's amazing. Who's your favorite player in the W to watch right now? I enjoy watching Kansas this year. Oh, I mean, you know, I got to be honest with you. When she was in L.A., I just didn't like her attitude. And, you know, I had Coach Wade on the show. And just but this was before all this started, the whole season. And just what, what kind of person he did, is and how he brought out the best in that team and her. And just her, you talk about being in the zone as a team. I mean, that run is nothing like I've seen before. It was just unbelievable. Just a credit to everybody involved. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I coached for Indiana Fever, and so mm. the Sparks was my scout. And I honestly, this is going to sound very crazy, but I used to scout Candace's hair. If her hair was done, that, <laughs> that meant she was going to have a great night. Like single-handedly, she could win a game in the second half by herself. Wow. But if she came in the gym and her hair was not done, she had a rough day. Like daughter was sick all night, you know, I mean, she was dealing with stuff that most players wasn't yeah. was dealing with. Wow. Right? And so, um, yeah, I was scouting her hair. Like I watched countless film and I was like, when her hair is done, she That's crazy. Out. So it was a lot about her, um, just kind of attitude and her mentality for that day. Mm. I watched very closely when she went to Chicago. I was very happy when she went there because she's back home. Mm -hmm. Um, now she's got a babysitter for her daughter. She's right. Like some responsibility taken off of her. Her family is, her high school can finally see her play. For girls, that matters. Those exterior little things add up to a lot, right? So I was happy that she had that, right? That kind of support. But it was going to be interesting. I, I was on Clubhouse actually, and they asked me this question if I thought the sky was going to win a championship. And I said, it's all going to depend on Candace, like how that chemistry works out. She's a dominant personality. She's very Kobe like. She's an incredibly mm -hmm. high basketball IQ. So she is a player coach. And if the coach is not strong and their X's and O's, she's not going to respect them, first of all. She's going to overrule them on the coach on the floor because she knows what to do. Right. And mm -hmm. she feels like better than the coach even. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, it's just going to depend on, cause she's a leader. Are they going to accept her lead? Are mm -hmm. they going to be like, you don't tell us what to do. You're not our mother. You come from the spark. But if they welcome that kind of atmosphere and that kind of feedback and that kind of drive, you know, she's got that Pat summit background in her. If they accept that, they will be very good because Vandersloot, like she was the oh, missing piece. Absolutely. Perfect team for her. Literally the perfect team. No pushback. Listen, and she could be herself. Mm -hmm. Quigley, Vandersloot, they oh. use pick and roll like no other. Oh. They understand like, like, like 
CP3, you know what I mean? Like, like it makes you wonder how they were 16 and 16 after the regular season, as good as they played in the playoffs. Like, just what a what an amazing run. Yeah, like Chauncey Billups used to use a, a pick and roll, like understand how to do that. So when you add Kansas to that, if the chemistry is well, they will do well. So I watched and her leadership style, she adjusted a little bit, a little bit in how she lead, led. Um, and they were receptive to it. Very receptive. Absolutely. Yeah, but I think her. Coach Wade's personality helped a ton. Yep. Yep. They had her mic'd up for a lot of games. So we got Absolutely. to hear it out loud what she was saying. And she's the type of person she don't care if a mic is on. She's going to say what she <laughs> to say. I was so very proud of her. Oh, she, and amazing. There were games where she didn't even score a lot of points. No, I know. In it emotionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She caring for her teammates. She was still involved. And so, yeah, I really enjoyed watching her this year. I'm, oh. I'm not happy how things are playing out for her now. She deserves oh. that. Absolutely. And love watching her on television. She's just yeah. a brilliant mind, a natural. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Her, her contract, her TV contract that she oh. has she deserves that because absolutely just hearing her thoughts, like commentating a game as a color commentator. I did color commentating, you know. Totally. And so it's basically you're just saying what saying what you see. Yeah. I do that anyways. I turn the piece on mute. <laughs> Because I, sometimes I don't want to hear the commentators. And I'm commentating my own game. And I'm like, I get paid to do this. This is incredible. So to see Absolutely. Kansas, she's beautiful, you know. Yes. So show up very well on TV. Totally. Another role model for our young girls. Um, yeah. And so now she can reinvent herself after her playing days, but still stay relevant. Totally. Like O'Neal. And if she has the right agent, mm-hmm. she can... Um, kind of like Shaq just still stay very much in the picture so I'm excited to see what the future holds for her on the other side she'll definitely have a lot have a lot of seats at the table all right last couple questions uh if you could have five people at your dinner table who would they be of all time dead or alive dead or alive Maya Angelou Mm. Nelson Nelson Mandela Mm. Jesus (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's been answered before absolutely i kind of want to have eve sitting there because i got some questions for her but <laughs> how many people do i get again five uh, yep um my brother who passed away of cancer lymphoma cancer oh no i didn't know that i'm so sorry yeah but incredible incredible guy in oh. humanitarian, actually wait what was the last thing you just said and humanitarian. Humanitarian, gotcha. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, let's see. One more. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's tough. Um no presidents, no Yeah, Barack Obama. I was just thinking. Okay. About Not Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Barack. Interesting. Wow. Um, if or two, I could add a six, I would add. Yeah. See, that's Gillum. one of the questions I ask sometimes who the next person would be. I would add my cousin Joe Gillum, who died of a crack overdose, who was a quarterback for the Steelers when they didn't think that Blacks were smart enough to be quarterbacks, but won two championships with the Steelers in the 70s. I would like to have him at the table. Mm. So interesting, man. So many amazing nuggets today. I go in Clubhouse a lot also, and some of the conversations in there are very interesting. Uh, some of them can be toxic, but uh, the collaboration that happens in there and and uh, just meeting people from different walks of life, I find very interesting. How did Kobe's death affect you? Tremendously, because I was in LA at the time, mm. uh, not too far away from where the plane crashed. And so to be in that environment and feel the weight and impact of the people around me when it happened. And I actually went to the Staples Center that night. It was unbelievable and very, very emotional. I I mean, I met Kobe one time, but I didn't have him on speed dial, you know. Yeah, Yeah. But I cried as if that was my brother, you know, like I, like I, 
I felt like I knew him, you know, but, and I think because I was in California, it just made it so heavy. And so, um, I, I can't even explain the words, but I was deeply, deeply impacted by it when it happened. I mean, and what he was doing for girls and women and his daughter and, you know, just the whole, the whole thing is, it was just so beautiful to watch. It, it and was I'm looking for somebody to pick up that torch, like the girl dad. Can somebody mm. pick that torch up and keep running with it? Because we were actually headed in a good mm. direction with that. Like, I, I really think like he could have been the next WNBA coach and would have been okay with that and really got invested in that. Like, that's where I felt like things were headed and it would have brought more media attention and more NBA players that have daughters and absolutely I mean, it, it was it was it could have been a whole movement so um mm. i'm very grateful for what he did for women's basketball and it wasn't just recently you know what i mean he's been planting seeds in women's basketball for a long time trained and helped like i remember going to play the sparks and he was in the gym like he'd teach anybody and help you and he'd watch you and try to learn from you or to give you some tips and stuff like that so um, I just miss his presence and what he represented because he was a winner. It was just like no excuses, win. You know what I mean? And that now is is gone. That kind of mentality is is leaving now. So definitely, he will definitely be missed. Now yeah, we could all learn from that uh, Crawley Mamba mentality for sure. That uh, old school, grind it out. Um, no excuses, uh, do anything it takes to, to win and succeed mentality. And well, I can't thank you for being number 18 on the show. It's uh, I, your time is so valuable and I can't thank you enough. I'm so glad you're better and uh, to spend so much time with us. Uh, I love the conversations. I love learning and listening and, and hopefully people learn some things and it resonates with some people in a lot of different spaces and what we talked about and had some fun at the end. And uh, you know, anything we can do for you and for those of you watching, Crawley Creations, we'll finish with, the, with that. I got my masks that she made for me. I got, I got my apron that I'm going to give as a gift. The patchwork for, apron. Yes, I got, I, got my, I got my apron that's going as a gift to one of the family members who are also Steeler fans. Yeah. And so it's amazing. I love it. And uh, so anything you want to do to, to plug that, feel free or anything else. We've been in 28 countries. You know, we're, we're trying to work towards 25 women of the W to honor this 25th season. And uh, always very humbled and grateful that people come and share space with, a, with an older white guy. <laughs> yeah, I just want to give a shameless plug. Crawley's Creation is a fashion and interior design company. Um, I've been branded, so I'm on every platform under Crawley's Creation. That's IG, Facebook. I'm on TikTok. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Clubhouse. Mm, let's go. I'm everywhere. Um, we're, on <laughs> Etsy, we're on Etsy and Pinterest. And, um, and I just got a um, huge partnership with Shop LC. Oh, yeah, let's uh, go. I had never heard of them until they reached out to me. And now I see them on TV all the time. Yeah, they're big. They are. And so um, they're going to, I'm, I'm now moving more towards the creative director and CEO. So oh, I man. create designs. They will produce them in-house. They will sell them on their, on TV, oh. put them on their website. And the stuff will also be sold on my website, obviously, but I'm super excited about 2020. So this is going to launch. Um, this is going to happen March or um, April of 2020. So this is the spring collection. 2022, yeah. 2022, yeah. Yeah. The spring collection. Oh. So obviously- now if that's not a reason to work hard and follow your dreams and then use your platform to let things organically grow and then someone finds you. Yeah. Man, that amazing. is amazing. Amazing. And I started, I started making clothes because I was six feet in the sixth grade, Mike, with a size 12 shoe. So where do I buy my Easter dress and my right dress? You know, they didn't make Christmas it for dress. a 12 year old girl. Right. So I learned how to sew and, um, and my mom learned how to sew when she was eight. So collectively we bring 100 years of sewing experience. So oh. we're going out a online sewing course that will keep 
<laughs> I took home economics in high school and it was one of the best classes I ever took. I learned how to freaking make a pillow. I mm-hmm. learned how to cook and I learned how to type in high school, which is not taught anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, that is well, so where, awesome. Where does Shaq buy his suits at the mall? Nowhere, right? Where does Asia Wilson buy her right. pants? You know, nowhere. So not just the tall people, there are people who are petite. There are people who are heavy top. There are people who got a big butt and a small waist. Where are they getting their clothes? So we do custom orders, but we want everybody to feel proud of how they're fearfully and wonderfully made. You Uh, need clothes, we can make clothes to fit you. So I feel really good about just helping people look good at what they do. I spoke at a school yesterday and I don't want to be worrying about whether my pants are long enough or just, and people looking at the flaws in my outfit and not hearing my message. I want to just stand there flat footed, be proud, deliver the message, touch lives and go on about my business. So that's what we're doing. We are literally, we prayed over that mask that you have that you would stay COVID free and, <laughs> you know, and you can have a safe holiday as you're cooking in the kitchen for your Christmas dinner. That's right. So, so that's our goal and our vision for this. Love and it. I've been doing it for years, even while I was playing and coaching because I couldn't find clothes in the mall to fit me good. That's yeah. amazing. You know, we've had three people on the show that do things in that space. Um, uh, Moolah Kicks is now in Dick Sporting Goods and Natty White uh, has the first ever female brand only basketball shoe uh, at 22 years old. And so I know Puma has followed suit and Nike had, has done some things, but to, to have a young entrepreneur doing that. And then we've had um, Phaedra Knight on the show, president of the Women's Sports Foundation. And she's got her PSK collective that's everywhere. Walmart, TJ Maxx, you know, JC Penny, Lids, you know, and it's about it's about inclusivity. And mm-hmm. so that's really what it's about and for, for you, for Natty and for Phaedra. And I applaud you for, for, you know, helping women, especially in those spaces. Uh, it's so sorely needed and much love and the utmost respect to you, all the women of the W, the, the sisterhood, the sorority of sisters, and for your endeavors, for what you're doing now um, after basketball and leveraging your platform as you should, uh, to, you know, to, to make the world a better place. So man, mad props to you. Much love. Thank you. And shout out to my husband, Brian Spann. We're newlyweds. Um, Let's go. We just sold his house today. So I'm getting ready to go so we could celebrate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's so great. Congratulations. And uh, like I said, anything we can do for you, uh, obviously people heard it, you know, go check it out. Check out our new restaurant in Chapel Hill um and anything else that you're involved with it seems like it, it, it's turning to gold so that's amazing for you so happy for you you know the, the power of the black dollar you know the spaces that are shifting when it comes to entrepreneurs collaboration in the black and brown community investing in the black and brown communities you know that's that's where you know you can see the impact of george floyd rest in peace and people coming together and saying enough is enough and, and whether it's entertainment, restaurants, clothing, you know, there's, there's a shift going on policy changes, education, healthcare, like it, it all needs to change so that we can bridge these, these uh, narratives that are still, you know, too far apart. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike, for doing this. Thank you for what you do for sports and particularly women's sports. Absolutely. So- more people like you so thank you and not just sports but you're adding politics and all kind of things with that which is important as well so thank you all right we'll stay in touch uh love your stuff love you and and we'll talk soon all right have a great time celebrating with with uh your husband the newlyweds ladies and gentlemen (laughs) (laughs) i love it all right talk to you soon have a great weekend have a great holiday and happy new year thank you all right all right all right there you go ladies and gentlemen sylvia crawley join us here in the sports deli where everyone, especially women, deserve a seat at the table. Uh, Remember, Black Lives Matter. Stop the bullying. Stop the Asian hate. And contact, please contact your local politicians for any injustices that you feel like are going on uh, and at the state level. And until next time, remember, it takes a village. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Much love. Peace. Here's a little bonus story uh, in case you wanted uh, some more content. Uh, from Sylvia about uh, her recent trip to the doctors. 
Listen, Man. I just had a um, video conference doctor's appointment this morning. And they said from my fall that I had, I had a hemo. Hematoma, had, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a, a clot, like a blood clot. That's Unbelievable. The, like four centimeters big. I just did an MRI and they and that's what they saw. And they said it's going to eventually dissolve itself <clears throat> over time, but it takes like nine months to go away. That and is. It, yeah, my doctor was like, did you have some kind of trauma to the right side? This is caused by trauma. I was like, oh, I had a fall. I hit my head. And they did a full body scan, but they didn't pick up this blood clot. It probably formed a little bit later than the day of the incident, you know? Yeah, of course. Now, so this was just a separate uh, doctor's appointment. This had nothing to do with, with the accident. And, they, and then they just noticed it. Yeah, I have a fibroid. I have to get a fibroid removed. I have a fibroid in my stomach. That is the size of a cantaloupe. Jesus. I've been in the gym like doing abs like crazy. To... <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is clearly diet. So I cut out sugar, bread. I drink, I don't drink soda. I um I cut out pork. Wow. I don't eat a lot of beef anymore, just turkey, fish, and chicken. Man, we are in alignment. This is crazy. And it still didn't make my stomach go down. Like normally. I got to just do cardio because I play pickup with guys. Well, I yeah, stopped yeah, yeah, yeah. it. So I was out of shape. Now that COVID's kind of gone and people are back in the gym, I just didn't want to go back because I was so far out of shape. <laughs> so I finally got back in the gym. I've been playing ball with the guys. I've been working out, lifting, ab workouts like crazy. Nothing was making my stomach go down. So finally, I cut out my diet. And when that didn't work, I was like, something's wrong. Did you have any sharp pains or anything? Yeah. I was about to say, you should have sharp pains usually associated had, with that. Yeah, I've had fibroids for like 15 years now. Mm, I just wow. learned to deal with the pain. Right, yeah. I have a very high threshold for pain. So I just was like, wow, this is no different for me than the last 15 years, but it didn't affect my figure like this. Like yeah, my yeah, yeah, stomach yeah. is huge. Wow. So, yeah. So they're going to look amazing. You wouldn't know it. Thank you. Well, my arms are still like super skinny, my ankles, but my stomach is like, I'm That's so crazy. Wow. Hair shaped now. So I have surgery on December 22nd. Wow. Five days from now. Yeah. And I'm going to be down for Christmas. It takes 72 hours to recover from this surgery. They're going to go through my growing with a catheter and treat it that way. So then they actually can get the blood clot. They can treat the blood clot too while they're in there. Or I could just leave it alone, and let it go away by itself. So that is unbelievable. Yeah, it's crazy, dude. So I'm like,